We now return to New Guinea, land of the unexpected. Europeans first set eyes on New Guinea in the 1500s, but it was not until 1930 that outsiders braved the interior. They were looking for gold. Along the way, they encountered butterflies as big as dinner plates, tree-climbing kangaroos, giant insects, and creatures so beautiful they were named birds of paradise. But on this island of mountains and ice, heat and rain, the prospectors also made another startling discovery. In their quest for gold, they stumbled upon a Stone Age culture, one of the last to be discovered by the modern world. Voices echo in these forests, voices strange and unexpected. They belong to animals found nowhere else but in New Guinea, the great island just north of Australia. Because of its isolation, everything on it has evolved in unique ways. New Guinea is the largest tropical island in the world, but there are no monkeys or apes here. Instead, kangaroos climb the treetops. This is a good fellow's tree kangaroo, the most brightly colored of its kind. Kangaroos which live on the ground depend on their powerful hind legs for getting around and for defense. But a life in the trees means these kangaroos have developed very strong front claws. They're essential for grasping the bark as they forage for leaves and fruit. Their docile, quiet appearance belies their ferocity when threatened. Tree kangaroos have been known to kill hunting dogs with one swipe of their heavy razor claws, crushing the dog's snout or ripping open its stomach. Since their favorite foods grow right under their noses and since they have no real predators, tree kangaroos have no incentive to polish their tree climbing skills they can afford to be clumsy. This is a Doria's tree kangaroo with a joey in her pouch. Doria's tree kangaroo is the largest marsupial on the island. The males weigh more than 50 pounds. The surrounding sea has kept out not only primates, but many other mammals as well. 
These are the feet of the most dangerous animal to stalk the forest. A flightless bird, the cassowary. It stands as tall as a person and weighs 110 pounds. Many a man has been disemboweled by one kick from its powerful claws. Only the most skilled hunter dared stalk this formidable adversary. And if he succeeded, he proudly wore the cassowary's feathers in his headdress. The absence of large predators makes the forest floor safe for the cassowary and another striking but less formidable bird. The crowned pigeon. It's the size of a turkey, and while it can fly, it's so heavy that it rarely leaves the ground. Megapodes, too, are quite big and fly as little as possible. Their name means Bigfoot because they use their feet to dig deep tunnels in which they lay their eggs. They don't sit on their eggs but rely on the warm soil to incubate them. The ground is continually heated by nearby volcanic springs. Because there are so few predators here, megapode eggs are left unprotected, but they're not completely safe. Human beings are the major threat to their eggs. Papua New Guineans are expert farmers and hunters, but megapode eggs are especially valued. In a land where protein is scarce, these eggs, because of their size, are more coveted than the eggs of other birds. Wrapping them in palm leaves ensures a safe journey back to the village. Because megapodes breed for nine months of the year, the people can collect their eggs three times a week. Their annual harvest is nearly a million eggs. The megapode population may not be able to withstand such a harvest indefinitely. These people and the unique wildlife that surrounds them live in one of the last untouched rainforests in the world. In the late 1800s, the age of exploration, New Guinea was still virgin territory. Its climate, its harsh terrain, its hostile people, all kept outsiders away. But after expeditions had climbed the Alps, conquered the Himalayas, and penetrated the Amazon, white adventurers turned their eyes to New Guinea. The Dutch grabbed the western half of the island and the Germans, the British and the Australians fought over the rest. After establishing themselves on the coast, the Europeans began to look inland. One early naturalist spoke in awe of the place as he wrote, the very mention of being taken into the interior of New Guinea sounds like being allowed to visit the enchanted regions of the Arabian Nights. In this startling, lush and isolated world, animal and plant life grew into wildly extreme proportions. Naturalists swarmed to New Guinea, eager to record everything.
As one wrote, it's impossible to step outside without seeing something new and interesting. One thing that was interesting was the size of these new creatures. This stick is really an insect, almost 12 inches long. One foot from wingtip to wingtip, the Hercules moth is the biggest moth in the world. Bird-winged butterflies also glide on giant wings. With a wingspan of 10 inches, they're the world's largest butterflies. But what transfixed the naturalists were the bird voices they heard throughout the forest. And one only had to look up to see a profusion of color, a rainbow lorikeet, a great cuckoo dove. The natives believed if one dreamed of lorikeets or doves, one is dreaming of men. But to dream of women, one must have dreams of the birds of paradise. There are 38 species in the world, and most of them are found in New Guinea. All these birds are male. They're the most colorful sex because they need to attract a mate. But their dazzling colors may also warn potential predators that they're poisonous. New Guinea is the only place on Earth where scientists have discovered deadly toxins on a bird's feathers. These lesser birds of paradise are displaying on a communal tree. The dull brown female flies in and out, sizing up her possible suitor. She chooses the best performer as her mate. Usually, the first chosen male makes 90% of all matings in that season. New Guineans believe a woman's soul changes into a bird of paradise. The birds are black and brown, the color of a woman's skin. The display plumes are like skirts, and the new plumes are beautiful, like a young girl. That is why dreaming of birds of paradise is to dream of women. As the sun sets, the island's most unusual and secretive animals awaken. The spotted couscous, a possum, has a surprisingly colorful coat for an animal that only emerges after dark. Once New Guinea was connected to Australia, and that means there's a wide variety of marsupials stranded on this island, up in trees or living on the ground. This ground couscous spends the day hiding in a hollow tree and has now emerged in search of a snack. It eats insects but prefers fruit. 
In fact, the females have been known to carry fruit back to their dens in their pouches. Most of the marsupials here are slightly different from their Australian relatives because these marsupials are adapted to survive in rainforest, which is rare in Australia. This is a wallaby, one of six species unique to New Guinea. All of them are small and dainty, so they can move with ease through the undergrowth on the forest floor. This looks like an ordinary mouse, but it too is a marsupial. It's a spiny echimipira, a type of tiny bandicoot. It feeds on almost anything, from earthworms to fallen fruit. Other forest animals are more particular about what they eat. This tiny sugar glider lives on a sweet liquid diet of sap and nectar. Feeding sites are usually spread far apart. So to get to them, the sugar glider sails from tree to tree. Some of the native people are wary of the sugar glider. They believe sorcerers transform themselves into this animal to spy on their victims. When feasting on the blossoms of a eucalyptus tree, sugar gliders pick up pollen on their fur. As they move to another tree, they pollinate it. But the most numerous pollinators are bats, a blossom bat searching for nectar in a banana flower. Bats arrived from Asia by flying, but many mammals, including carnivores, weren't able to cross the sea. So some of the most significant predators are snakes. A brown cat snake. Another night creature, a land crab. In most of New Guinea, rain falls constantly, soaking everything. Explorers not only suffered from the heat, but could only travel at a snail's pace as they slid and tumbled through the mossy undergrowth. These humid conditions, however, are ideal for land crabs, and New Guinea is crawling with them. Land crabs scavenge vegetable matter from the forest floor, and their diet serves them well. Some grow to the size of footballs. Almost completely terrestrial, they travel to the sea only once a year to lay eggs.
In the 1930s, Papua New Guinea was still a territory of Australia. Its colonial governor was determined to explore all the uncharted areas in his domain. So he sent out small patrols to scout this unknown region. The area they had to cover was a blank place on the map, the size of South Carolina. At the same time, gold prospectors were braving the journey inland in hopes of making their fortunes. Australian Mick Leahy was one of them. Young and robust, he was undaunted by the challenges of these formidable jungles, although he knew they were dangerous. He wrote in his journal, we saw a young chap come down the opposite side of the river. We thought he would cross the river on the swing bridge. We walked to greet him. By the time we reached the river, he had disappeared. His dog, wet and battered, was found downriver. No trace was ever found of the young chap's body. A person making a first crossing who did not know the strength of New Guinea's streams could step into the river and be immediately engulfed and swept away. Water has been a major force in shaping this island's dramatic landscape. This is karst, a type of limestone that has been partially dissolved, creating vertical walls and jagged spires. Early explorers called these limestone cliffs a universe of death. One patrol took 10 and a half hours to go a mere 300 yards. The patrol leader wrote, it's a frightful stretch of country. The rock stands on end and forms craters large and small, and every step has to be watched, for the limestone edges are as sharp as broken glass. After 10 days of grueling travel, the patrol's rations ran out. Just in time, the limestone gave way to a less treacherous terrain. They found an underground cave filled with bats and gratefully devoured them. The patrols never canvassed all of this forbidding territory. Even today, many of these rocky strongholds remain completely unexplored. This region is called the Highlands, a stretch of mountains which cuts through the heart of New Guinea for a thousand miles. In 1930, Mick Leahy was the first to penetrate these peaks. He was on a quest for gold, but he discovered much more. He hired coastal natives to carry guns, medicines, and most importantly, a 16 millimeter movie camera. This historic footage is the first glimpse of the interior of New Guinea. The terrain proved even more difficult than expected. They scaled one ridge only to find another, crossing mountain after mountain. After days of tough travel, they looked across a valley and were startled at what they saw. The valley was filled with gardens and pinpoints of light. And people, tens of thousands of people. 
the prospectors had unwittingly stumbled upon the last great unknown culture of the modern world. Through the gift of the camera, we're able to see a people encountering the outside world for the first time. To people who use stone tools, who had never seen metal, who didn't know what a wheel was, these newcomers brought a whole wealth of treasures with them. The New Guineans call the white men, men of all things. Leahy showed them a wind-up gramophone. I'm looking on the bright side, so I'm walking in the shade, picking up my chest, hoping for the best, looking on the bright side of life. I'm waiting for the right tide, and if luck comes to my aid, giving me a break. I shall be away. The people the thought the gramophone was a box full of ghosts. And having no previous experience of white skin, they also believe the Australians themselves were spirits, probably ghosts of their own ancestors, and therefore friendly. On the bright side, both days care and strife, I wear a grin. But on later visits, the Highlanders were less in awe of strangers and the prospectors feared for their lives. They frequently used their guns to demonstrate their destructive strength. Although Leahy was one of the more enlightened of the European invaders, his unit still managed to kill almost 50 of the Highlanders. Other explorers had no such humanitarian compunctions. They felt they could only make it through the jungle by killing their way through. The native people retaliated by attacking all newcomers, earning a reputation for ferocity. In spite of outside influence, the fierce Highland people maintain their traditional lifestyle to this day. These are the Dani, the last major Highland tribe to be discovered in New Guinea. They live in the western half of the island in the Indonesian province of Irian Jaya. The Indonesians tried to force them to give up their traditions, including their unusual penis sheaths. But the Doni refused. This dance celebrates victory in a tribal dispute. One of the most warlike tribes lives on the eastern side of the highlands. Deep in the forest, smoke rises from the homesteads of the Huli people. Like all highland people, they construct houses that are deliberately low to the ground. This enables a small fire to keep the building and its occupants warm during chilly mountain nights. Huli husbands live separately from their wives in a communal men's house. During the evening hours, they socialize and fashion tools from local materials. <laughs> Within the living memory of these men, stone axes were the best available too. Great care was taken to make such a simple yet highly effective instrument. Today they are still made but for a different purpose. Remnants of the Stone Age have attracted the modern world and stone axes are made to sell to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> Male solidarity is strong among Huli men. They keep their interactions with women at a minimum, 
Too much contact is considered potentially dangerous to a man. In this region where fighting is constant, training in the arts of war is their major preoccupation. The Huli also cultivated another form of art. With simple wooden and stone tools, they created a most sophisticated system of agriculture. They built rolling terraces and perfectly square gardens on the steep slopes of their mountain world. One impressed patrol officer wrote, Below us, reaching as far as the eye could see, lay the rolling timbered slopes of a huge valley system. On every slope were cultivated squares of such mathematical exactness, I thought of wheat fields. There is archaeological evidence that gardening began here 10,000 years ago. That would make New Guineans among the first farmers on Earth. The main food crops were probably sago, coconut, and banana. The European introduction of sweet potato revolutionized life in the highlands. These Huli women are digging for its tubers. Sweet potato grows in abundance in these poor, cold soils and has become a staple. <laughs> the success of the sweet potato has enabled the people to raise more livestock. The population of the highlands has boomed. Some people are moving out of the mountains and into the coastal cities. The downtown marketplace overflows with all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Foods from nearby forests also add to the variety. Karuka nuts and marita fruit are from different species of wild palm trees. A pig in one's garden is like having money in the bank. Pigs have long been prized in the highlands. They're a source of wealth, status, and bargaining power. The pigs are owned by men, but it's always their wives who look after them, and the care is extremely thorough. During the day, the pigs accompany the women to work in the gardens, and even at night, they remain by their sides. These women share their own homes with the pigs, while their husbands sleep in their communal house. The evening meal is roasted sweet potato to be shared among all the members of the household, human and animal alike. Since pigs are so highly valued, maintaining this capital investment is crucial to each household. In fact, no man could marry without a gift of several pigs to his prospective father-in-law. As with all investments, there comes a time to cash in. The pig is not butchered as food for its owners, but is to be given away to settle a serious debt. These men have recently fought a war with their neighbors. In many areas, tribal warfare is still common. Payback killings perpetuate an endless cycle of fighting. 
In this case, enemy warriors were killed and their comrades want compensation or they've threatened to retaliate. The payment is carried towards a neutral no man's land for the transaction to take place. Behind the pork bearers are warriors. They're heavily armed. They take no chances when meeting with their enemies who are also carrying lethal weapons. The enemy tribe stops at the exchange site where the pork has been laid out. One wrong move could ignite another battle. The payment is carefully counted out to avoid any argument. They have accepted their reward and rush in for the take. Highland clans settle their own disputes. It's been difficult to police these people according to Western laws. Compensation ceremonies are common in settling everything, from wars to adultery, even car crashes. These days, the payments may involve cash or crates of beer, but pigs are still the commodity most valued, partly because they're a good excuse for a feast. The Huli men have brought with them another prized possession, headdresses made from exquisite bird feathers. Only the most experienced men are allowed to make these ceremonial feather wigs, and only then by following strict customs. The headdresses are believed to offer ancestral ghosts a permanent place to reside. The headdresses are an integral part of the men's lives, and these warriors often travel far from their homes to obtain the necessary feathers from the birds of paradise. This is a blue bird of paradise. In the early morning, its calls to attract a mate ring through the trees, making it easy to find. The male king of Saxony has extraordinary feathers sprouting from behind its ears. He's a cautious bird, difficult to catch, which makes his plumes even more treasured by the hunters. a brown sicklebill bird of paradise. Not long ago, hunters would enter the forest in the early morning fog. They would set traps, then lie in wait in blinds with their bows and arrows. They believed if they shot a bird with its feathers already damaged, it must have dreamt it was going to die. So it spoiled its own plumage in preparation for death.
These long plumes of the ribbon-tailed Astropia are still especially coveted. It has a longer tail for its body size than any other bird. Just as the birds up here are different from those on the coast, the forests in the highlands are markedly different from their lower counterparts. Drops of water dance on the breeze, drenching everything with moisture. Branches are overgrown with greenery. A single large tree may support well over 300 other plant species. Some of them are orchids, which do especially well in the clammy conditions. The higher up, the colder it gets. At nighttime, the temperatures can drop to freezing. Marsupials are active after dark, and those that live here are well adapted to the cold. The silky couscous has much thicker fur than its lowland relatives. An old native legend holds that this strange mammal could transform into an even stranger one, the long-beaked echidna. This is a mammal, but it also lays eggs. It's related to the only other mammal to lay eggs, the duck-billed platypus. It's spiny like the hedgehog, but the spines are covered in dense insulating fur. The long-beaked echidna is a throwback to the old age of the marsupials. Snuffling along, looking for worms, it's unaware that it's out of step with the rest of the world. The thick carpet of moss hides beetles, but the striped possum has no trouble sniffing them out. Striped like a skunk, it can also produce a strong, noxious odor when threatened. It has a long tongue, perfect for removing larvae from nooks and crannies. This one has found a meal in a fallen log a beetle grub. Much of the world first heard of New Guinea by an account from Captain J.A. Lawson in 1875. By this time, Europe was already jaded with the accounts of its voyagers and could only be aroused by news of the extraordinary. Lawson traveled around New Guinea for seven months and soon afterward published a book. In it, he boasted of making more earth-shattering discoveries than anyone else in his day. He raved over his discovery of the highest mountain in the world, 4,000 feet higher than Everest, of waterfalls 900 feet wide and lakes 30 miles across. He also raved over spiders as big as dinner plates, of huge apes, striped cats, even bison.
Captain Lawson described ferns with black fronds and trees measuring 84 feet around. There were giant crimson lilies that left their perfume on a person for hours on end. To top it off, he claimed New Guinea was covered with daisies the size of sunflowers. In his day, no one could dispute it, and although later explorers were able to dismiss his accounts as a hoax, in some ways he did capture the mystery of the extraordinary plant and animal life that lives on this island. In fact, the truth has exceeded anyone's imagination. In the quiet woodlands, a black-throated honey eater takes nectar from an umbrella tree. Another elusive bird lives only in these woodlands, the McGregor's bird of paradise, never before filmed. In these high altitudes, there are even parrots, like these plum-faced lorikeets. But much farther up lay the last great challenge. New Guinea's mountains are bold, intimidating, and draw explorers like a magnet. But after many failed attempts, some explorers realize they aren't made of iron and that it takes great strength and willpower to make it into the clouds. The ultimate conquest is New Guinea's highest mountain, Mount Jaya. At more than 16,000 feet, it's the highest peak between the Andes and the Himalayas. Native people don't journey up to the glaciers. They believe if they do, they will become blind, their noses and ears will fall off, and their teeth will break into pieces in their mouths. But Westerners aren't so easily deterred. Eventually, some do fulfill their dream of making it to the top. Those who dream of finding a fortune in minerals are not disappointed either. New Guinea is rich in gold, silver, and copper. This used to be a mountain, but now it's leveled, becoming the world's fifth most productive copper mine. It's called Akteti. In this remote region, the 20th century has thrust itself into a Stone Age world. Giant trucks, each weighing more than 100 tons, flatten what was once a pristine landscape. Thirty tons of rock are lifted out in a single scoop. 150,000 tons of mountainside disappear every day. This massive engineering project is hugely profitable. Octeti has earned Papua New Guinea over 40% of its total export earning. More and more, these mines encroach on native people's homes and land. Sometimes the people rebel and stall the progress of these mines. But the lure for minerals is too strong, and outsiders continue to flood in. The 
The new arrivals to this island brought even more cultures and languages. But most importantly, they brought air travel. Helicopters and planes have been the major force in opening up the highlands. They bridge together the old world with the new instantly. Air transport is the only sure way to get through New Guinea's jungles and mountains. And there are nearly 500 airports. In just one generation, the native people have found themselves confronting a modern technical society. New Guineans try to maintain their own lifestyles and traditions while faced with the wealth and power of the newcomers. In a broad sweep, Western influence has tried to change their customs, their religion, even the face of their land. For the young especially, it is a terrible struggle to choose between the newfound wealth and ancient traditions. Today, thousands of Highlanders have come out of the mountains and into the coastal cities. And for the first time, people from the coast are meeting people from the interior. Despite all these changes, many still retain the customs and rituals which so intrigued Mick Leahy 50 years ago. It was the airplane that enabled Leahy to make his fortune. Mick Leahy found some gold, but not the mother load he was looking for. Instead, he and his brothers turned to raising coffee in the highlands and made millions. He had three children with highland women, but finally settled down with a European wife. The decades since Leahy's first visit have not been enough to fully explore New Guinea. This island still holds secrets. New Guinea has given us a great gift the ability to witness progressive change over thousands of years in a single instant, of seeing ancient Stone Age life and modern day existence in just a blink of the eye. The heart of this island not only reveals a living museum of natural history, but an unparalleled view of our human history as well.
This is PBS.